Welcome to Slash Forward. Nature is beautiful, but also brutal and unforgiving. Failing to remember that may put you at her mercy. And that's the theme we're going to explore in this video, when a simple hike turns into one of the most terrible and harrowing experiences you could possibly imagine. If you are imagining what that might entail right now, you're going to find out how well you did as we open in the deep dark woods, panning down toward a possible decomp situation. But that's gross, so let's go visit Alex and Jen in the parking garage. A couple of young lovers preparing to escape the pressures of the big city and get primal, you know? Connect with their ancestral roots and engage in some sloppy, primitive lovemaking. Never put your hat on the bed, son. Never put your hat on the bed. This guy knows what's up. They soon arrive at the front desk to check in for a canoe rental. No map is required as Alex has been to these hallowed grounds many times. By himself, no prior primal lovemaking. Jan is special. Unfortunately, his favorite spot, Blackfoot Trail, is currently closed due to some ne'er-do-wells traipsing about and generally disrespecting Her Majesty. So now we all know where we're going and our general capabilities. All that's left is to do it. It's end of season, so they're unlikely to run across many people. Once they arrive at the launch point, Jen posts one last thirst trap and then it's blackberries away for the weekend. As they shove off, we delight in a cornucopia of possibilities regarding the true details soon to beset our eyeballs. Whatever those may be, we'll be enjoying them for the first time with Jen. When they run ashore, Alex is so excited to get going that he rushes and smashes his foot with the tip of the canoe, a minor inconvenience that he will surely walk off in short order. He then offers Jen an emergency whistle, but she came packing some bear spray. Feeling a bit undermined, he takes a moment to critique her packing, which includes a road flare, like she's gonna need AAA or something. Once he is reasserted atop the power hierarchy, they head on down the trail. They're unlikely to see much more than a squirrel, but Jen is bugging out just in case. Mother Nature can be a fickle bitch. They hit all the top spots, the water spring, the old bench, and then pitch their tents for the night at their camping plot. After providing fire for his lady, Alex capitalizes on this win by enticing her into a little swim. You're welcome. They enjoy a brief splash and plunge while somebody might be watching. At dusk, Alex ventures off to gather additional wood. So Jen takes a little time with the bench, does a little bird watching, and is watched a little herself. When Alex finishes dividing his logs, he returns to find another woodsman in their camp. As you could imagine, the hackles go up instantly, which is not helped by Jen admitting that she invited their guest to join them with his fishful bounty for dinner. Alex tucks away and calls Jen for help so he can have a private word with her. He can't believe that she's actually comfortable with this. The man has an accent after all. Brad senses the vibes and prepares to leave, but trail law requires they insist that he stay regardless of whether he brandishes a comically large knife. About five hours later, they're eating some good food and enjoying a good laugh, but then Brad turns the evening on its head by asking Alex if he's Mexican, since he works in landscaping. Then he insists on having potatoes only only as their side dish, playing into his Irish heritage. He also demonstrates a really clever way of turning everything Alex says around on him unnecessarily. He takes a leak next to their eating area like an animal, and then he chides Alex about his pedestrian plans for their hike before wolfing down his dinner, again, as an animal would. As he leaves, we learn that he's still fairly sour about the lukewarm welcome he received, which has resulted in him carrying a fairly large chip on his shoulder. I think you dropped something. <laughs> and compel him to show how he's the big man of the woods. Message received, bro, just get out. Alex is upset, but not scared. He declares their guest a certified weirdo and not dangerous, but intends to take his ax as a sleeping companion just in case. Her job is to wait for him in the dark and consider what she's done. By morning, all is forgiven. Jen awakes to sizzling bacon and a steaming hot kettle of coffee. Then they strike camp and continue further inland while filling the silence with discussions of the lore of this sacred place. Alex comes across a track that gives him pause, but he is unperturbed as they're going off trail anyway. Despite the fact that his foot still smarts, he climbs all day. Then that night by the fire, he peels off his blood-soaked sock and gently removes the slimy toenail that's been haunting him. So, problem solved. Jen then attentively cleans and dresses her man's wounds and gets some fresh socks. Afterward, she pauses to soak in the moment and recognizes that everything is turning out all right. After a bit, Jen wakes up to the sound of acorns playfully peppering their tent. Oh. 
plus other things. But they do stop, and per trail law, noises that go away warrant no further consideration. At dawn, we see they hung his bloodied sweaty rags at the camp perimeter as a warning to other socks in the area, with no other ill-intended consequences, I'm sure. While looking for a spot to dig a latrine, Alex finds evidence of a medium to large disturbance. Jen is now spooked, but Alex assures her that the destination he's taking her to will be well worth the effort. As they continue on, Alex rejoices in the savory aroma and frosty sensation induced by the mastication of fresh fronds of wintergreen. But Jen? Jen smells something that is akin to whatever the opposite of that might be. She is unwilling to ignore it and eventually stumbles upon one of nature's miracles, a rotting deer carcass in the process of being reclaimed by the soil. This is actually a positive omen in some cultures. You might think this would sour the mood, but they continue on even as things get increasingly frustrating. The trees mercilessly cling to Jen and eventually guide her gently to the forest floor to deliver, we come to learn, what sylvologists refer to as a dirty Sanchez. No antiseptic, eh? That close to your mouth? Okay, no need because they're here, bro. The most magical lake overlook you're likely to ever see. Except he got himself a little turned around and pulled an oopsie doopsies on them. But honestly, if he had burdened them with the weight of the map, could you imagine how far back they would still be? Also, to make sure Jen remained engaged, he left her Blackberry back in the car. Why would you do that? Uh, hubris. And masculinity, as fragile as a quivering baby bird. He comes clean and admits that he's been unsure of their bearings since the first fork they came to, which is too much to bear. I'm sure you would keep your cool in this situation, but Jen lets him have it about how much of a loser he is and how little she cares about his stupid lake. This commentary is especially harsh when we learn that it was so important to him because he was going to make this nostalgic locale their nostalgic locale by proposing to her. They take a little time to be alone with their thoughts and, after cooling off, apologize for all the unretractable statements that now define their relationship. Then they set up camp. Alex takes the necessary precautions to keep the critters out of their stuff, and they batten down for the incoming storm, which passes without incident in a very unremarkable fashion. Unbeknownst to them, what is likely a friendly bear comes sniffing around to welcome her new woodland neighbors. But she's very shy and only leaves indirect evidence of her visit, which is easily blamed on wayward raccoons, the thieving bitch bandits of the forest. They head down the mountain to try to pick up the trail, but find that the weather has drastically shifted the landscape. This makes everything new and exciting, but also unrecognizable and dangerous. Jen takes the lead here because why not? And she exercises her very particular skill of finding strange things in the woods. In this case, a bear bed. After another hard day of hiking, they sit around the fire and let it all sink in. This time, we get a fresh round of apologies from Alex, who's looking for some reassurance of his esteem in her eyes. Once that equilibrium is returned to some semblance of normalcy, they pop the protein and champ in celebration, sarcastically toasting to their sucky situation. Could be worse. I'm not sure that's true. It looks like lovemaking may be on the menu, until they soil their slacks at the sound of something large and heavy moving around out yonder. Alex yells into the darkness, but there's no indication that whatever it was got spooked, which is the first indication that you are in immediate danger. They retreat to the protective bosom of the tent. I guess only time will tell if that was a sufficiently good idea. It seems possible that it was, as another night passes without incident. They wake up with empty bellies, but in generally good spirits. Things are looking up, right up until Alex takes a peek outside and finds himself staring down a fairly large bear. Alex left his axe in his bag, which is outside, so they only have bear spray. But since it's trail law to leave the campsite as you found it, they wait for the beast to do something truly egregious before spraying. If you're not sure what that is, don't worry, you'll know it when you see it. Like taking a substantial chunk out of Alex's shin, Jen is successful in her initial repulsion. Then, after working through the shock and letting things come back into focus, they have a moment of realization. Alex, you're gonna be fine. But her statement and the subsequent events are mutually exclusive. Alex gets dragged out to the breakfast table where he pleads with Jen to run, especially since he is now learning how terrible it is to be eaten alive. 
She does run, but then inexplicably stops to face down the bear and act like she's gonna do something. After thinking better of this, she grabs something and takes to running in earnest. But she's also lost blood, and in her weakened state, her footing fails and causes her to pull a 720 endo face first into a rock. She eventually wakes up with all of her appendages still attached, so she tries screaming for help, but the shrieks go unanswered. She takes a moment to put on the ring she swiped before her retreat, a small comfort in these trying times, and then sets a course for downhill. As the sun sets and she stands out in the stark, shelterless wilderness, she feels the fear of her ancestors. Soft, fleshy, furless primates, essentially helpless when alone and vulnerable to tooth and claw. After another round of unconsciousness, she awakes to the sounds of a rescue chopper, but she tries to hail it auditorily rather than visually, and it passes her by. She carries on until, by some small miracle, she hears the sound of running water. She laps it up as it appears to be not entirely stagnant. It is mildly rancid, but in her current condition, it is surely as refreshing as a pitcher of Alabama sweet tea. She uses this opportunity to treat her wound and go into momentary despair. Ignorance is bliss, so she gobbles up a bushel of berries with no consideration for the possible consequences, but is interrupted by the return of her pursuer. She takes off into the woods and runs until she reaches the water's edge. Jen is able to stun the bear momentarily with her whistle, giving her a chance to begin climbing down the steep, rocky facade. She discovers that she's a better rocketeer than she knew, but this is a double black diamond, so in the end, she skips the bottom third and absolutely destroys her ankles in the process. After confirming that she does, indeed, have an extra joint now, she decides that you gotta do what you gotta do, and splints up so she can carry on. She doesn't stop even after the sun goes down, and lights her way with that stupid road flare that's worthless in the woods, but it ends up bringing her enough luck to allow her to survive another night. She keeps keeps on going until her dysentery flares up and recommends a brief nap to recharge. When she wakes back up again, she is now fully assimilated into nature. Upon demonstrating that she has reached max rank as a woman of the wilderness, the woods mercifully release her back into society. Her final trial involves a relaxing paddle across the water, representing the final tranquil moments before spending the rest of her life haunted by the screams of the man she loves being disassembled by a bear an experience that sets her apart from almost all other people, ensuring she will always be lonely even when not alone. Her first role in this new life, acting as a cautionary tale for anyone who thinks it would be cool and fun to venture out into the unforgiving wilderness. The lesson here, of course, is that you can avoid the embarrassment that comes from being wrong by not acting like a know-it-all in the first place. It seems like a small thing, but as we just saw, failing to follow this rule can have huge unexpected consequences. Speaking of the brutal and unforgiving qualities of nature, I promise you've never seen anything like this video here, so check it out. Now that we're here, I want to congratulate you for making it to the end of the video and affirm that you are a very special person because of it. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.